Welcome to our Living Word Home Church service. I hope you're doing well. I'm Pastor Benny, and I just want to welcome you here today. If you're joining us for the first time, thank you, and I'm looking forward for you to be blessed as we enter and grow in God's Word together. Amen? Well, you know, I want to just thank Jay for that worship. It was a blessing. And I want to thank Lauren Essing for that message she brought last week. I'm sure you guys were all blessed. And as we prepare today, as we continue in this new series, My Future Self. You know, last week, Lauren mentioned... Uh, where do you see yourself five years from now? 
Now, can you actually see yourself or see anything based on your present course of action? Where do you see yourself? Or do you currently see any momentum at all? If so, where do you see it taking you? You know, any idea, the destination, and does it look promising? We're going to answer some of these questions. How about that? You know, because if you don't like what you see right now, this is the time to get off that train. If you don't like where you're going, it's time to put the brakes and let's just take a minute and get off. You know, our theme, as you heard me say over and over again, where do we go from here? You know, before we get started, let's just enter the Lord's presence with prayer. Amen. Let's just bow our head right now. Father, we just thank you for this time. As we are asking you to guide us and lead us to your truth, Lord, you've promised that your word would not be returned void. So we thank you for your word and your promises, Lord. We thank you for your revelation, your truth, and giving us your direction as to where we need to go, Lord, at least from here and now. And we just thank you for your blessing in the mighty name of Jesus. And all the saints said, amen and amen. Well, like, where do we go? You know, wherever you are right now, whether you are just holding on by the skin of your teeth, you know, going through the motion, running the rat race, or on that wheel that just keeps going round and round. Whatever it may be. Maybe you're trying to climb that mountain that only seems to get bigger and bigger. Is that where you're at? Wherever or wherever it is, God has a plan for your life. If you are wondering, where do I go from here? The first thing you need to do is to seek the Lord and to find out what he has planned for you. You know, the scripture that I hear quote, that you hear me quote so often, you know, when I put my hand on my face and I say, I, I, I quote this particular scripture as the Lord is speaking me to Rick. I want you to turn your Bible to the book of Jeremiah 29, 11. And this is the NIV version. He says, and with that hand on your face, as the Lord is speaking to you, he says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. Doesn't, isn't, that, isn't that amazing? That's what I hear. Folks, isn't it comforting to know that your God is there promising you a future, a prosperous future. Your destination is in God's hand. That's what he's saying. He has the place and time already worked out for you and for me. Can you start to see yourself moving in this direction? Are you looking forward to something substantial and prosperous? So I want, I want you to turn your Bible right now to the book of Matthew, chapter 10, verse 1. And this is the NIV version. He says, he called his disciples to him and he gave them authority to drive out evil spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. Imagine you are a disciple and you are fishing here. Imagine that. So you might not quite be a disciple yet, but you, let's say you have a career. And it might not be fishing, but whatever it is, here comes Jesus and he says to you, hey, I have a five-year plan for you. What do you say to that? Jesus called his disciples. He didn't draft them. He didn't force them or ask them to volunteer. He chose them to serve in a special way. Christ calls us today. He doesn't twist our arm and make us do something we don't want to do. We can choose to join him or remain behind. When Christ calls you to follow him, how do you respond? I want you to turn right now to the book of 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 4. While he himself went a day's journey into the desert, he came to the what they call the broom tree sat down under it and prayed, and he might die, that he might die. I, I, he says, I asked the Lord, Lord, he said, take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. This is Elijah, the mightiest of all prophets, who sits alongside the Moses in the Hall of Fame of Prophets. Elijah, who held the record for the most miracles in the Old Testament until his servant Elisha came along. You know, after experiencing two major victories here, Elijah was extremely fatigued and then discouragement set in. 
You know, you heard last week, if you heard last week's message, Lauren gave this some statistics as to how long the average pastors or youth pastors last in ministry. And sometimes it's not long, that's sad to say. So often discouragement can set in after spiritual experiences or, or successful events, especially those that require much physical effort and involve emotional stamina. Those moments that you put in all your energy into, everything you have. Could Elijah see five years into the future in that moment? He could barely see tomorrow. He can barely see. You know, I want you to turn right now to 1 King, chapter 19, verse 6, 8. Uh, you know, I'm not going to read it verbatim, but here is the angel of the Lord came to Elijah twice to minister to him. He fed him to strengthen him. And that's what God does with us. You know, in moments of weaknesses. And in those times, God shows up to comfort us, to feed us. But here he feeds, uh, he says the angel of the Lord comes and he feeds them and he sends them on a, on a 200 mile journey that took 40 days and 40 nights with barely enough food for the trip, mind you. See, but when he, he reached Horeb, the mountain of God, there Elijah went into a cave and spent the night. And I'm going to start, let's just turn our Bibles to read from 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 9 through 11. And again, the NIV version. And it says, the word of the Lord came to him. He said, what are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I have been very zealous for you, Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, broken down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. The Lord said, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Now, God does something pretty dramatic here, drastic, just to catch Elijah's attention. A man, to really get him to snap out of it. But let's continue reading. 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 11 through 15. The NIV version. Then a great powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. After the fire came a gentle spirit. And when Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. Then a voice said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I have been very zealous for you, Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, tore down all your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left. And now they are trying to kill me too. The Lord said to, uh, to him, go back the way you came. And go to the desert of Damascus. When, when you get there, anoint his zeal, king over Aaron. Also, anoint Jehu, son of Nimshe, king over Israel. Anoint Elisha. Son of Shaphat from Abel Manoah to succeed you as prophet. Hold the phone. This man is exhausted, fatigued, and God, although he feds him, feeds him, he's sending him on another mission. But this mission, listen to what? It's almost like I hear all with, out with the old and in with the new. Do you think Elijah? Tell me, do you think Elijah was blown away, confused, or relieved? Hearing that he's going to be replaced. I mean, if God said to me, hey, Benny, uh, I have a replacement for you. I would say, whoa, how about the beach ministry at the Cayman Islands for me now? You know, I would have no trouble with that. Sign me up. But don't kid yourself. 
Letting go is not a, an easy thing to do. Even if it's beach ministry, folks. We have to be sensitive to what the Lord is asking us or asking you to do. Elijah had an intimate relationship with God. He's been serving the Lord for a while now, confronting all these bad kings and one after another. But regardless, Elijah did as the Lord said. Sometimes we got to take a step back. What we need is to get our instructions from God. Turn to someone. What we need is to get our instruction from God and to maintain that communion with him, to pray. It's important to seek God for answers. I may not know your situation, but I'm sure that God does. Elijah was an example of what the servant was about. Learning to stay the course until such a time. And I mean until God said otherwise and maintain his course of obedience. Elijah understood he was God's servant, committed to the kingdom work. Regardless, God told Elijah in, in advance who was going to replace him. And he said it was going to be Elisha. That's what we call advance notice. God was about to advance his kingdom. Could you see God advancing you and his kingdom in the next five years? What is God telling you? What if he's going to, uh, we're going to, going to be replaced in order to advance his kingdom? Think about that a minute. What do you see or understand of an advancing in this kind of way? How often do you find companies tell their executives or managers or supervisors to, to uh, train someone younger than them, only to, only to have them replaced, to be replaced by them? You know, a lot of times you don't see it, see it coming. Before you know it, you are just forced into retirement. It's hard to advance if you don't know your purpose, who you are or where you are going. You know, I am speaking from experience here. I remember many years ago, I was just put in a situation to lead this church. And let me tell you uh, how overwhelming it was to know uh, you have to be entrusted with all this responsibility, especially with others. You know, I felt unprepared, uninformed, unsatisfied with the current situation. What was I supposed to do with all of that? You say, lead, of course. But we had members who were jumping ship. Others were making worse, uh, making matters worse, causing friction. There was just, uh, you know, others just were not, just neglecting their duties, gossiping, fighting, instead of just helping, fasting, and praying. I remember clear as day, and one elder came up to me and, 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 and asking me, and let me just clarify, none of our current elders here, asking me, so what's the vision for the church now? What is the Lord telling you? What is our vision? Where do we go from here? Folks, in my head, I'm like, what? The walls are coming down on us here. You need to run for cover. That's what I said to myself. And then I said, oh Lord, help me. Where do we go from here? Jeremiah. Chapter 29, verse 12, the NLT version. In those days when you pray, I will listen. That's what I heard the Lord say. All I remember the Lord telling me was, plug the holes in the boat, referring to the church. Folks, all I knew was before we can advance or move forward, we had to stop the bleeding and take the water out of the boat. He gave me simple instructions to follow. And not that it was going to be easy. God told Elijah uh, to go and anoint, you know, Hazel, anoint Jehu, you know, anoint Elisha, his replacement. None of that was easy. I know it sounds easy. I remember reading about the prophet Samuel when God told him to go and anoint David. He was terrified. He knew that if King Saul found out, he would have him killed. No easy task. 
1 Kings chapter 19, verse 19, the NLT version. So Elijah went and found Elisha, son of Shaphat, plowing the field. There were 12 teams of oxen in the field, and Elijah was plowing with the 12 team. Elijah went over to him and threw his cloak across his shoulder and then walked away. Elisha left the oxen standing there, ran after Elijah and said to him, let me go and kiss my father and mother goodbye, and then I will go with you. Elijah replied, go on back. But think about what I have done to you. Listen to what he's saying here. Elijah tells Elisha to count the cost before he denies himself to make sure that before he leaves it all behind, he knows that he's picking up that cross to follow him. There is no going back here. You know, a lot of time when we get saved, we want to keep uh, one foot in the door, you know, with God, and another out, you know, to do whatever we please. You know, we don't follow through all the way. You know, when, it, when it's convenient, we, we participate, we pray, we study. Although our intentions are honest, we are not fully committed. So as soon as we you know, get uncomfortable, you know, we, we, we find some excuse to walk away. Now, now, this is no judgment. This is what Elijah is telling uh, Elisha to sort of you know, keep in mind that there's, a, there's only, you, if you're going to go in one direction, follow through. Elisha is saying, make sure you understand that you are, you, we are embracing sacrifice. You are embracing a life where you are not going to be in control once you choose to follow Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You have to realize that He's in control. And that is what Elisha is trying to communicate with Elisha when he says, go back but consider. It's interesting that Elisha knew exactly what he meant when he threw the cloak and he placed that cloak on his shoulder. Elisha made a strong commitment to follow Elisha. He killed an oxen, the, the very oxen that he was using in that field. And he made a feast out of that. And with that oxen, he cannot, I mean, by killing the oxen and making that feast, he was communicating. See, he was making a strong commitment to follow Elisha. Follow Elijah that there would be no returning back to that life of a wealthy farmer. You know, if you made a living, you know, fishing on a, on a fishing boat, and you burned down that boat, you will have nothing to go back to. This is what Elisha was actually doing. The feast was more than just a feast. When he killed the oxen and gave it to his neighbors, you know, in this celebration, it was an offering to the Lord, thanking God for choosing him as his prophet. That was Elijah's commitment to not looking back. He was looking to his future self. Remember, God chose Elisha. It wasn't Elijah that chose him, who chose him. We often want to be in control of some of these choices. But I want you to tell you right now, Right now, I want you to turn your Bible to the book of 1 Peter, chapter 2, verse 9, the NIV version. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. So where do we go from here once we get saved? How do, you, how do we help our future self? You know, the problem here is that so often we are based our self-worth on our own accomplishment or on what others say and not on our relationship with Christ Jesus, which is more important than any job, any successes, any wealth or knowledge, anything that we can actually exist in this world. 
if you can believe that. Remember, we have been chosen by God as his very own. You have been chosen by God as his very own to represent him. So let us keep in mind you have worth because of God. And remember, folks, when we get saved, we're not getting a genie in the bottle here. It takes developing a relationship with Jesus. It's going to take a spark to get that fire going. And without that, without that spark of you making that decision to completely commit and to follow through, you're not going to get anywhere. Elijah was a rich farmer and, we, and, and he gave it all up be, to become a prophet of God. You, know, you don't always have to give up your vocation to become a prophet unless God calls you to something specific. Most of those times you have to just wait for God's timing. So stick to what you're doing until the, you hear from the Lord clearly. Turn to the book of Jeremiah, chapter 29, verse 13. The NLT version. He says, if you look at me wholeheartedly, you will find me. Folks, if you, he, he's saying you will find him. You will hear from him. Elijah is now serving under Elisha for 18 years as his servant. In those 18 years, the only thing you hear, or you, you, you see or hear in the word is Elisha do is pour water on Elijah's hand. I'm sure he did a lot of other things because a servant, you know, he prepares meals and, and does such things. For the time being, his role was to support the ministry until such a time. Maybe you don't see any progress in what you're doing, but you are afraid to move, to change. Change isn't easy. Sometimes it takes a push. Sometimes uh, something's going to have to force you to move. For me, it took a crisis. But what if there is no crisis? You know, Sir Isaac Newton is famous for discovering the rules behind gravity. His theory described as the law of motion, you know, inertia which states that objects will remain at rest or in uniform motion in straight line unless compelled to change its state by the action of an external force or dramatic action. Now, this is interesting information here. The point is that everything in the universe wants to keep doing whatever it is doing. It doesn't want to change. Everything is resistant to change of state. Change is not easy. Turn to someone. Look in the mirror. Accept the fact. We call that inertia. And the word inertia itself comes from the Latin word lazy or idle. Everything in the universe, every object, everything, the first law of motion states is lazy. Like some people I know. I'm not going to mention any names or point any fingers. That should have been an ouch moment. As your life goes on, the harder it is to become, to, becomes to change. It's harder to change. The longer you've been entrenched in your laziness, the easier it is to stay lazy and idle. That's the fact. We can sometimes become like a brick or a brick house and we don't want to move it. We don't want to move because we can't move. It would take a massive blow to bring it down, causing major debris flying everywhere, pieces everywhere. The bigger the brick, the more pressure force is going to take to apply over an area to bring it down. The scary part is that we can get comfortable we're laying in a bed of nails. We, we can't, right? Then the idea of making any changes. Some would rather stay uncomfortable with the pain because they are com familiar with it until it becomes unbearable. 
Elijah, Elijah now is, has news to tell Elisha, which may not be pleasant news. Elijah's life was nearing his, his final conclusion. And God tells Elijah uh, in advance he's going to heaven. In other words, he's going to die. Now, I don't know about you, but if you, uh, <laughs> you better be mature enough to hear that ahead of time. Because to hear news that, like that is not easy, and especially not to lose it. That's maturity for sure. We get the slightest pain in our bodies and, off, and, our, and we freak out. Our mind starts to spiral out of control, thinking the worst. Here, yeah, but Elijah was looking forward to fulfilling his mission and receiving the blessings and the future promise of eternal life. That's, he, he, his, his eyes were on the Lord, on the mission. The first time God gave Elijah notice about being replaced, that transition took 18 years to play out, to play itself out. Elijah, in the meantime, learned to follow and trust God. Folks, change is difficult. Change hurts. And here's an ouch moment. Change happens when the pain of staying the same is greater than the pain of change. I'm going to say that again. Change happens when the pain of staying the same is greater than the pain of change. I hope you heard that. Painful moments will help us get from one place to another, but it requires us going through it. Sometimes it requires something drastic, taking drastic action to get to where we, we need to be. And it may take some time. Remember Newton's theory. It won't move unless you find some way or something to move it. To force you to move. Do you need something drastic to cause you to pray and fast? You know, we need discipline. Discipline level training to become more humble, more secure in our purpose. So that we know where we're going. Sometimes it's difficult to change your life because all the normal energy to, uh, that you apply to change get spent on overcoming the, again, the inertia. This is why baptism and salvation go hand in hand. They're the same thing. Only the water baptism is symbolic to what happens spiritually. It's confirmed physically. You know, it's a drastic thing when we are emerged in the water and the idea of our sin, our cares, the weight of the world is taken down. Never to be reminded of it. Being purified, freed as if you, as if you emerge your old nature and it, takes, it, it, it goes down to the deepest part. Never to be surfaced. And your new nature, a new creation in Christ Jesus appears. That's being born again. So when you get saved, and you get baptized, that concept, it's almost like your old nature is done with. And the new nature in Christ becomes you. It's interesting that Elijah's last miracle and Elisha's first miracle were around the parting of water. Where they cross at the, to cross to the Jordan. You know, that's where the mantle, the cloak, and the spiritual blessing, all of it, took place. From Elijah to Elisha. Um, but let's read a little bit. Let's just turn to 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 9. He says, when they had crossed, crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me, what can I do for you before I am taken from you? Let me inherit a double portion of your spirit, Elisha replied. You can ask, you have asked a difficult thing. Elijah said, yet, if you see me when I am taken from you, it will be yours. Otherwise not. As they were walking along, 
talking together, suddenly a chariot of fire and horses of fire appeared and separated the two of them. And Elijah went up to heaven in a whirlwind. E Elisha saw this and cried, I mean, Elijah saw this and cried out, my father, my father, the chariots and horsemen of Israel. And Elisha saw him no more. Then he took all of his clothes. He tore them apart. He picked up the cloak and that had fallen from Elijah. And he went back and stood at the bank of the Jordan. Then he took the cloak that had fallen from him. And he struck the water with it. See, where now, see, he says, where now is the Lord? Where is now the Lord, the God? of Elijah. He asked, when he struck that water, it divided to the right and to the left, and he crossed over. The company of prophets from Jericho who were watching said, the spirit of Elijah is resting on Elisha. And they went to meet him and to bow to the ground before him. Look, they said, we are servants. Have 50 able men. Let him go and look for your master. Perhaps the spirit of the Lord have picked him up and set, and set him down on the same mountain. Elisha says, reply, do not send an end them. But they persisted to search three days but did not find him. And when they returned to Elisha, who was saying, staying in Jericho, he said to them, I told you not to go. Not only did Elijah not die like a regular person, he was taken away in chariots of fire. I mean, that's pretty drastic. I mean, to, for Elijah to see God's power in that way was supernatural. It was for a reason. You see, if you know the end of the story, you don't have to worry where you're going to go because you're secure on who God is in your life. If you're here today and you need to know where you're going from here, I want, I want to pray for you. I want you to see the blessing that we have to look forward to. You know, whether it is five years now from now, 10 years, 15, 20 years from now, you know the end of the story here. You know where God can take you. Because if God's for you, nothing could be against you. So I want to take this minute and pray. Let's just bow our heads right now. Father, we just thank you for this time. We thank you, Lord, that we may not know exactly where you want us to go from here, but we know that wherever we go, we look forward to your blessing your hand of protection. We look forward to being that royal priest of that holy nation, that people that belongs to you, Lord. And in the same way that you called Elisha and Elijah, Lord, you have called each and every one of us, Lord, to be your servant. So we just pray for those that right now who don't have any direction, that have no purpose, that you would minister to them, that you would speak to them, that you would open their heart, their minds, their soul, and their spirit to be blessed beyond measure. Let them see. Let them have spiritual eyes to see, Lord. Let them see through your eyes and not their own. I ask you to open their eyes and their heart right now to receive what they can do right now moving forward. Let them imagine what you can do with their lives if they trust you with it. In the mighty name of Jesus. And all the saints said, amen and amen. Well, I hope you can join us on our Q&A right after this. You'll find it in, on the website there, the livingword.nyc. Join in our Q&A discussion in case you have any questions and you want to elaborate a little more on what we got. Amen. But remember, God is good all the time and all the time. God is good. Have a wonderful day and God bless you. Take care.